Okay, now we're, you're going to tell us more about okay, the construction yeah. of this well, okay. area. So, <clears throat> this was in 69, and about that time, we were thinking, how are we going to, see, there's no legislation, and actually opposition from within our own department, you don't do stuff like this. The Fish and Game Department is not set up to worry about things like pupfish that mm -hmm. are no good to eat, and people don't want to catch them, and they won't buy licenses, which is what we're interested in. So, uh, <laughs> thought, well, we got to do something. It was like Devil's Hole in a way, when we talked about earlier, uh, where there was no legislation, no planning, no nothing, and this was essentially plowing new ground. It was essentially a, a major revolt against conventional fish management, which is making fish available for people to catch. So then, okay, fine, we got to build a refuge of some sort to keep these fish isolated from predators and alive. So the city of LA, the Department of Water and Power, was just totally helpful in this whole thing. They catch a lot of flax and things, but not in this case. They had a very good Northern District engineer then, a guy named Dwayne Georgeson. And Dwayne went from here on down to Water and Power in LA and then with the Metropolitan Water District, a big job down there. But he arranged for this to be designed by their engineers and most much of the construction was done by them and also with our local conservation camp, which is an inmate facility here, and with the big dump trucks and all. And so we built this dam here. This was set up to accommodate the four native fishes of the Owens Valley, and we then for four called it the Owens Valley Native Fish Sanctuary. Okay, okay, now we, we got our little squint. background it's a devastating thing duo. Well, we could, we could both wear our glasses and be the Blues Brothers. So, <laughs> um, Phil has showed how you constructed this in the dam, mm -hmm. but now the thinking has changed, or things change. Well, it's been 40 years since this but, was constructed right. originally, or thereabouts. So, Steve, you were saying you'd spent most of your career undoing what Phil had done. No, no. <laughs> well, I guess ah. I might have said that. <laughs> Which is exactly true. You fell out by the dam. Earthquake what is, entered into so this too. What, what, just what is that what the, the uh, saying about we we stand on the shoulders of giants and forget them? <laughs> but, uh, the one of the practical problems with this dam was well, there's twofold. One was that it created about a five-acre lake, mm -hmm. and mm. and that lake over time became totally dominated by cattails, which altered the habitat in a way that didn't favor the pupfish. Okay. And then the other thing was um, largemouth bass gained access a couple times. And I don't really know During the 1986 that. earthquake came out here and the dam had been breached, we actually saw bass swimming up through the breached dam. And, it, and do bass like to eat those oh, yeah, pupfish? Oh yeah, they love them. And I don't think we mentioned the pupfish are only about an inch and a half long yeah. or an inch long. That's right. Yeah. They're about the size of Jessica's <laughs> pen. <laughs> Get her on camera. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get on camera. And they're very territorial, so they actually will seek out and defend their territories against bass, mm -hmm. which for the bass is probably like having the popcorn come to you. you know? Yes, yeah. it's, it's oh, a, yeah. oh, it's exactly what it is. Yeah. So in, in other <laughs> settings, we've found that one bass can decimate a population of thousands over a period of months, mm -hmm. and. Uh, a handful of bass can eliminate them. We'll see that over in BLM weeks. Spring. So how did you, what changes were made? And I'd also like to hear the story of how the changes were devised. Oh yeah, well, um, we, uh, beginning in the, about 2002, set about trying to restore a similar um, project to the Owens Valley Native Fishes Sanctuary. Uh, this was one place that pupfish were managed mm -hmm. or, or reintroduced, but the strategy was to actually divide our eggs into multiple baskets, and so we, we had them in, in as many as ten habitats at certain times, but more often five or so, because of the high failure rate due to things like bass introduction and cattail encroachment. Mm -hmm. So. I was working on a smaller system on the east side of this valley called BLM Spring, and I managed to uh, recruit um, an intern from MIT, an undergrad in engineering named Genevieve Park. And Genevieve Park and I sat on the floor in the office, Phil's old office, with scissors and paper and scotch tape, 
and figured out how we could, we made a prototype figuring on how to make a device with sheet metal that would separate fish from water and not allow fish to pass upstream through it, but which would um, not require a huge dam to operate. Because here the, the water actually was falling five feet. And so in this flat landscape, a five foot tall dam backs up a tremendous pond. What we wanted to do was try and figure out a way to shrink the aquatic habitat back to its original contours and just manage it to be in the most natural state possible and still work a fish barrier. So we came up with this design, tested it, it works wonderfully. Um, and it only acquire, it requires six inches of, of falling water to operate. So it really, when we install that in a spring system like this, it, it doesn't back up much water. So you wouldn't have the five acre right. pond, yeah. which is small. So that, that has been devised and implemented in BLM Spring, and we're in the midst of restoring this system to, to like conditions. Um, and so that restoration has involved breaching this dam with heavy equipment, and we actually uh, took out the center portion of the dam and dug it down to the natural channel elevation, which over the course of a day caused a five foot drop in water level. And if you can see it's color coded, there's, there's green patches of cattails near the water. And then all those brown patches of cattails have been drained and dried for two years now. That'll burn, I guess. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> someday. Um, you will burn them someday or they'll just... Uh, they, they will last almost forever unless mm -hmm. we burn them. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, there's a landscape behind you that was like that okay. for about seven years until we burned it. And now the native vegetation is beginning to recolonize. We were asking Phil last night, and now we'll ask you. Uh, does the See endangered... See if you get the same answer. Yeah. <laughs> say, hold we, on. Uh, <laughs> we have heard that once a species is listed, which of course this has been forever, practically, as endangered, it becomes sometimes more difficult to manage the environment because of the uh, restrictions of the Endangered Species Act. Does that affect how you are able to manage here? It does. Um, and so sometimes there are restrictions that you just have to live with or, and work around. In this case, within a year of the bass gaining access to the habitat, there were no pupfish left. Mm. So there wasn't an endangered species angle in, in terms of planning our project and bringing the equipment in and, and doing this work. There is a threatened plant, flowering plant, uh, fish slough milk fetch. It's an, an endemic to fish slough, so it occurs nowhere else on the globe. And there's a population of it about 300 feet to our east. And it's um, sensitive to changes in water table, but the botanists felt that the dam actually was harmful and that removal of the dam would be beneficial to this population. Mm -hmm. So we, um, uh, that was actually one of the other reasons for devising a low head fish barrier mm -hmm. so that we would be able to eliminate the ele unnaturally elevated water table and sometimes the perturbations because we'd get beavers in here and they would plug up the old outlet works and we'd have water flowing around the dam and across the valley and through the fish slough milk fetch habitat. So th those days, knock, knock on wood, <laughs> are over. <laughs> well, it should really points out the difference between the department and what it does now and what it did oh, when yeah, you came yeah. here. Oh yeah, yeah. Been a major change. Yeah. I mentioned last night that much of this is a result of the Endangered Species Act making funds available to the states to do some of these things. So back in, when we were first building this thing, there was no support at all. None from the Department of Fishing Game. I don't want to complain on camera, but it still can be quite sparse. Yeah. <laughs> the the you just have to, financial yeah. Yeah. means. Yeah, yeah we're, we're low on the totem pole, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. But this, this change here looks dramatic on the ground, but it's really just an incremental adjustment. It's, mm -hmm. it's refining the basic idea of a fish sanctuary here and, and trying to eliminate some of the side effects that turned out we didn't like.